I've been thinking a lot about sex lately. Okay, not like that. But I have been thinking about how much sex has changed for me over the years. Like the way I used to have sex just doesn't really work for me anymore. And the things that used to turn me on just really don't. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this experience. Because between getting married to having kids, taking on responsibilities of adulthood, these things really change sexuality. So today I'm talking to two women who spend their entire careers thinking about this stuff. Later we'll hear from Dr. Emily Nagowski, who's a sex educator, researcher, speaker, and writer. But first up is Shan Budrim. She is a certified sexologist, published author, and fellow podcaster. So when I sat down with Shan for an interview, I told her all about how much my sexuality and sex drive has changed over the years. And she was quick to assure me that this happens to everyone. Yay, Shan. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yes! Uh, thank you for having me. I'm so happy. You know, when I was thinking about this episode as a whole and the whole topic of sexuality and sensuality, I mean, you're literally the first person that came to mind. So, Shen, sensuality and sexuality to me was always a very unknown territory because it was basically sex with a partner or that's really it, actually. There was nothing more to it. It's not something that uh, we talked about a lot growing up. It's not something that I was in a group of friends that, you know, spoke about it openly. So to me, it was just like a very simple, basic definition. And I feel like as I'm getting older, I'm finding that those two definitions are now two completely separate entities. To me, now sexuality is something different than sensuality. And there's definitely a crossover, but they're two, you know, their own topics. And that's what I really want to talk about today. I want to speak about these two areas. And I would love to start by asking you, what is sensuality? And what does it mean to you? We have to start with your definition, because that's the interesting story. I find that sensuality is something that I feel in myself that has nothing to do with anyone else, has nothing to do with my partners, nothing to do with the act of sex, is a certain approach to life and a certain state of being where everything just feels very fluid, romanticized, soft. That's what sensuality means to me today. What does it mean to you? It's interesting how you said that as you get older, the definition gets larger and maybe a little bit more dynamic. And I think for me, as I get older, it gets simplified that I used to make it this big thing that felt like I had to strive to get there or like I wanted, I did a series years ago called Sensual Self, which was me striving towards becoming sensual. But now I'm like, to me, to be sensual is literal. It is to engage in your senses. Most of us have five of them. Um, some of us magically may have 12 or 15, depending on how in touch you are with the universe and your soul and everything else. But to just be in, in the act of being mindful in one or all of the five senses. So if I'm eating a really great meal and I'm savoring the taste, that's a sensual moment. If I hear music that is wonderful to me and I'm giving myself a moment just to be present and engaged in the music, like that's a sensual moment. Um, if I'm being stroked sexually and it feels really good and I'm engaging in touch, it's a sensual moment. If I'm walking in the forest and I notice the way that a tree feels against my skin, that's a sensual moment. So to your point, there's definitely crossovers with sexuality and sensuality, but sensuality doesn't necessarily have to be sexual. So I would love to hear what sexuality means to you. Yeah, because I think it's, again, the same thing. Like when we think about the word sex, we think about gendered sex or we think about sex, the act. And then we think about, well, what is sex, the act, given the fact that there's so many different ways to engage in it? There probably isn't a one size fits all to be a sexual person, because for me to be sexual is to be an expression of my ability to produce life and produce pleasure. Right. And um, mm -hmm. so to produce life has to do with the sex I was assigned at birth and the sex that I you know delight in as somebody who 
uh, identifies with the sex I was assigned at birth. And then also it's my ability to feel pleasure and experience pleasure, mostly through my erogenous zones and my genitals. But that probably would be different for someone else. And someone who's asexual has a very different definition of what being sexual or sexuality means to them. I think what's important to note though, you know, I think that these terms, when we have these really rigid definitions, they feel um, unwelcoming to a lot of people. And for a lot of people, they start to distance themselves from it. I think broadening out the definition to give people an opportunity to say like, as we all are born sexual in that mm -hmm. we have gonads, we have ovaries, we've got testicles, or we have some variation of sexual organs or sexual parts or genitals. So we're all sexual to some capacity, but how those manifest and show up in your life is different for each person. So it's not a matter of this is the definition, does it apply to you? But here's the experience, you know, where do you find yourself on the broad spectrum of ways that you can show up as a sexual person in this world? Could your metabolism use a kickstart? Feeling low energy? Sakara has an answer. Sakara delivers science-backed, plant-rich nutrition programs and wellness essentials right to your door. Their ready-to-eat meals are nutritionally designed to deliver results, from ease bloat to boosted energy and clear skin. And right now, Sakara is offering our listeners 20% off their first order when they go to sakara.com slash Valeria or enter code Valeria at checkout. That's Sakara, S-A-K-A-R-A dot -A com slash Valeria to get 20% off your first order. Sakara.com slash Valeria. When I was thinking about this episode and I was thinking about sensuality, I find that I cannot be a sexual person if my sensuality is not activated, like if I'm not actively in it. And it makes sense, the definition you gave earlier, where it's truly just you know, all your senses are on, right? You're present, you experience it, and you kind of give in into that, that all these senses. And for me, it's uh, from the longest time when I was trying to figure out how do I become more sexual with what was available in front of me information wise, I didn't really have any answers. But right now, I find that that's my go to whenever I feel like I need to reconnect to my sexuality. I have to go through my sensuality. Just curious if it's something that you see that's commonly happening. Absolutely, and I love a formula. I love <laughs> concreteness, I love clarity. I think in the space of sex, love, relationships, dating, sexuality, there is so much ambiguity. And I think that people can look at that as a way to say, well, there's no way to figure it out because there's so much gray. But instead, mm -hmm. it's a matter of finding your shade on the map. You're one of 50 shades of gray. That answer for you rings perfectly true. I have this thing that I developed years ago that was called turn on triggers. And essentially it was from talking to so many people who, what ends up happening when we're in romantic relationships is normally when we first meet somebody that we fear, experience primary sexual attraction to, in that we just have like this visceral draw towards this person. We don't really have to do a lot to be sexual or to get engaged in like an act or desire, to get into a, a phase or a, of arousal. You gotta see that person and then things just go. So in essence, when you first meet somebody, biology is doing all the work for you to get into that space where a sexual encounter is possible or a sensual encounter with another person is possible. But as time goes on, and you probably have heard of the seven year itch before, um, but as love transforms from passionate, which is all about that dopamine, the adrenaline, the excitement, the I can't keep my hands off you, we might know this is a honeymoon phase, but as love naturally transitions from passionate to companionate, all of a sudden, the, that wonderful chemical cocktail that made it so easy for us to get into those spaces with someone else, it shuts off. And for some people, it's like a faucet and some people it turns down to a drip. But nonetheless, a lot of people then look at their partner and they're like, well, maybe it's over, right? Maybe I'm not mm -hmm. attracted to you anymore. Maybe the magic is done. And that's not the case at all. You could be with somebody who you are incredibly drawn to and you are incredibly um, connected to, but just naturally by virtue of the way that our brains work, you're going to feel this drop off of desire for them. And that's when love and desire and arousal go from being a roller coaster where all you have to do is strap up and then just go along for the ride to now a go-kart where you have to be really mindful 
about mm. inviting arousal, inviting desire, inviting lust into your life. And so turn on triggers is something I developed to really speak to that in that, okay, now we're past that phase. We're just walking by each other gives us butterflies. So now we have to be a lot more intentional and mindful about creating opportunities for us to have those moments together and acknowledging that not everybody gets there the exact same way. So what you just described to me is an environmental person. And that is someone who does need to be engaged through a sensory experience. So for them, having sex or making out with somebody on a pile of dirty laundry is like nails on a chalkboard. Um, it's about creating a, you know, a space for the body to feel present, the body to feel good and relaxed and settled before any other opportunity opens up. I'm not like that per se. I'm the kind of person that I actually struggle with mindfulness quite a bit where I can always be five minutes ahead or five days ahead or five years ahead in my brain. So sometimes sexuality is actually my pathway to being present. Like it's not until I engage in sex that I'm like, oh yeah, my body, this moment, the mm. feeling. And so for me, my turn on trigger is desire. It's when my partner expresses like a deep need for me in a really raunchy way usually, um, is dirty <laughs> talk on the fly, that that activates me to get into my body and to get into the moment. So I believe I put this quiz out years ago and over like 200,000 people have done it. I want to say that environmental was the most popular response. So in answer to your question, do many people require a sensual experience or a sensual awakening before feeling sexual? I, I think the answer is a pretty safe yes. I'm curious to hear about your personal relationship with sensuality and sexuality. How has your relationship changed over time? Yeah, it's been really wild. There's been so many definitions and moments of redefining that I've had to have with those two words. I remember expressively my first pregnancy, my second pregnancy were so incredibly different in that my first pregnancy was all about fight, fight, fight. I was like, I don't want to lose my sexuality. I don't want to lose my sensuality. I don't want to lose myself. The reason I decided to have a kid is because I wanted to share me um, with someone small and I wanted to share the best parts of me. So the last thing I want to do is lose that in this experience, in this process. So I was like, we're having sex with my husband. You know, we're having sex no matter how pregnant I am four times a day, <laughs> not four times a day, but you know, four times a week. And I'm still wearing lingerie and I'm still doing this and I'm working out all the time. And I was really like fighting against the current of my body. And I appreciated that. There was a lot of beauty in having the energy and the time to do that. And the second one, I was so much more sick than I was with the first. And also I had a small child. So my capacity and my time was so limited. I just didn't have the energy for that fight anymore. And so I wasn't having sex. My sex drive was incredibly low and I let myself go there. I let myself go into that flow. I didn't fight back and I love that. And it was really beautiful of an experience for me just to let my body take control and my feelings take control and not to judge myself. And it challenged me on my definition for self-love. It challenged my relationship like, well, how are we intimate if we're not physically intimate? It challenged so many definitions for me and I came out of that really more deeply in love and more deeply appreciative of not just my sensual and my sexual self, but myself overall. So yes, those things have changed constantly. I think that the biggest change for me is allowing myself to still be sexual and to be still sensual, even if I'm not making the space to actively engage in them. What are the biggest obstacles you feel like women face when they're approaching their sensuality or sexuality? Yeah, I do think that women feel a need to audition constantly, like audition to be good enough or to measure themselves. They're always checking in to say like, am I doing this right? Am I good enough? Why aren't I good enough? Rather than approaching things from a space of like, I'm doing the best I can and I love where I'm at, I would love tools to explore more. So rather than trying to be enough, inviting more into your life, I think is a definite positive mind switch that a lot of people could benefit from. That you are exactly perfect in this moment. You are doing 100% of what you could possibly be doing in this moment. You are enough, you are lovable, 
you are incredible, but more, you know, if you want more of a certain feeling or more of a certain kind of connection, that's a different kind of conversation rather than like, mm. I'm not enough. This is not enough. How do I get to enough? You're, you're already there as is. Um, so I, I do find that, yeah, the question, you know, we started this conversation kind of like, I'm on a sensual journey or I'm on a journey to connect with my sexuality. It's like, you don't have to journey there. You're there already. It's a matter of approaching things from a space of self-love versus an audition for self-worthiness. What kind of steps maybe someone can incorporate to bring in sensuality? Anything, you know, any tip, any, any thought that someone should keep in mind when trying to bring more sensuality into their lives? The word savoring comes to mind, savory. That's it. It's being with the moment, being with your body, being with the experience and you pick what you tune in on. So we could do an exercise right now where if I was to savor something about right now, I'm looking at the camera and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is work. I get to do this for a living, that's so cool. And as I look at the camera, there's also a really beautiful like king palm right behind it that's really vibrant and green. And the camera is black and this is green. I love the way black and green look together. And I'm just savoring in that moment. Visually, I'm like, this is beautiful. Like what I see in front of me, what I see of myself and what I see of my world right now is magnificent and that feels good. So that's the sensual moment. Thank you so much. And um, where can listeners find you and learn more about your work? Lovers and Friends, the podcast. I hope to have you as a guest, but there's great conversations around sex, love, relationships, and dating. If you enjoyed that, I promise you you'll enjoy one of the 42 episodes that are out now you have to reminding all my beautiful listeners that sakara is offering our listeners 20 percent off their first order when they go to sakara.com slash valeria or enter code valeria at checkout that's sakara s-a-k-a-r-a dot com slash valeria to get 20 percent off your first order sakara.com slash valeria hello emily hello i'm extremely excited for this conversation i'm a big fan of your work and um, i appreciate your you know putting all that knowledge and information out there so um, i'm excited to chat today me too could you please introduce yourselves to our listeners i am emily nagoski i'm a sex educator i have been for about 25 years uh, my first book was Come As You Are, The Surprising New Science That Will Transform Your Sex Life, mostly about the science of women's sexual well-being. And my second book, so it turns out the best predictor of a woman's sexual well-being is, <laughs> surprise, her overall well-being. So my second mm -hmm. book, which I co-authored with my twin sister, is called Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle. So first sex, then stress. This is an episode where I wanted to have... Uh, you here to just talk to me a little bit more about all these questions and thoughts that I've been having uh, through my kind of experience of understanding my sexuality, um, you know, finding tools to to get into that like sexual liberation, because I feel like I'm not there yet. Mm -hmm. As I got older, I actually found that I got more like in my own head. Um, and I'm a little stuck when where you know when it comes to exploring my sexuality and what to look ways to connect to it and to connect to my partner that's when i started to look for tools out there to try to see okay i want to move away from talking about sexuality to something else that will be less intimidating for me like less of a huge topic but will connect it back to sexuality which brought me into the topic of sensuality. To me, uh, once I started looking deeper and deeper into what sensuality is and just under trying to understand the concept and the difference between sensuality and sexuality, I feel like I felt a bit more relieved. I feel like I felt like I'm a bit more in control, but I just, I still need like clarity on these two concepts. Uh, I think it's true for most people as well. So uh, let's start with those two building blocks. Can you define sens sensuality and sexuality for us? Nope. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So it's like the question, like, what is sex? 
what is sexuality? Everyone's answer is different, and no one's answer is wrong. Broadly speaking, when people bring me to talk about sexuality, they want me to be talking about mostly clothes off, very, like, genitals are going to be involved. I think that might be the primary mm -hmm. thing that people expect me to talk about when they bring me in to talk about sexualities. Like, the genitals are going to be part of this conversation. With sensuality, mm -hmm. the genitals may or may not be involved, but it's going to be a broader conversation about the senses, as the word sensuality suggests. Mm -hmm. I think the, the thing that ties them both together is awareness of pleasure. What feels good? And under what mm -hmm. circumstances does it feel good? And under what circumstances does maybe even the exact same sensation not feel good? And as I get older, I understand that the actual like sexuality and sex is not so interesting to me. Hmm. Um, and it's more like if I don't get the sensual part, then I don't need the other one either. So genitals touching all by itself is not inherently the thing that motivates you to seek connection. You know, when right. I ask people, I run workshops and I ask people, um, what is it that you want when you want sex? Mm. And actually, the most common answer is connection. Mm. So I think a lot of people might, they might say it in different words, but they have a similar experience that it is not like the genital skins rubbing together that they want when they want sex. They want mm -hmm. the feeling of human connection with the whole person that they're with. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I call it sensuality, but how do you present it to your clients or students when you talk about that connection or that, you know, that, some, that added thing that goes into the whole experience? Yeah, so here's the interesting thing. When I hear you talking about it, I, my first response is, that's not added, that's inherent. That, that is sexuality. Mm -hmm. My experience and the way I was trained about it and what I know about it is that, that that romance, that spiritual connection is part of what sexuality is. Sexuality is, there's no such thing as sex that is just bodies touching. That's mm -hmm. a lie that I think people are absorbing maybe from porn um, and like, there's a whole conversation we could potentially have about porn, but mm -hmm. the main thing is learning about sex from watching porn is like trying to do driver's ed by watching NASCAR. Oh. <laughs> Those are professionals on a closed course with a pit crew. Right. That is not how it actually works in real life. How it works in real life is people tend to have some kind of relationship to each other. Even if it's like you just met a stranger off an app and you're meeting, that's a relationship. Mm. And it shapes the way you give and receive sensation with that person, which body parts you are interested in sharing with them, and the ways that you are willing to be vulnerable and authentic with them. And all mm -hmm. of that is inherent in what sexuality is, because it's a whole brain experience. It's not just about the sensation parts of it. It's not just about the physiological response. Whether or mm -hmm. not any sensation feels good depends on what else is happening in your mind and in the external situation that you're in. So the classic example is tickling. Um, I know tickling is not everybody's favorite, but if you're already <laughs> like in a great relationship and playful and aroused and trusting and then your partner tickles you, that has the potential to feel fun and to lead to other things. But if that exact mm. same certain special someone tries to tickle you when you're in the middle of an argument and you're real pissed off with them, that maybe that maybe doesn't feel as good. <laughs> maybe mm -hmm. slightly feels, as one of my students put it, violence would shortly ensue. Right. It's the same sensation, right? So it's mm. sensual. But whether or not it's pleasurable depends on the context. So... What makes sexuality good is not like just like touch me here, don't touch me that way. It's what is the context in which I'm experiencing the sensations. Uh, and part of that is your relationship. Part of that is your own mental and physical well-being. Part of that is like the state of the world. Other life circumstances is the label they give it. Uh, and they're talking about like 
worrying about your kids and worrying about money and worrying about work and worrying about the patriarchy and white supremacy and rapidly exploitative late capitalism. Like, if you're worried about mm-hmm. that stuff, the brain mechanism that controls sexual response is a dual control mechanism, which means it has two parts. And the first part absolutely is the accelerator, which notices all the sex relevant information, all the sex related stimuli. That's all the thing from your external senses, everything you see, hear, smell, touch, taste, but also everything you think, believe or imagine, and all of your internal body experiences that your brain codes as, oh, that's sex related. And it sends a turn on signal that a lot of us are familiar with. And it sounds like for you, a lot of the things that activate your accelerator are not straight up genital sensations. It's other stuff. It's the relationship. It's feeling connected, not just in your bodies, but uh, at a soul level. And then at the same Mm -hmm. time, it's a dual control model. There are your brakes. And your brakes are are noticing all the good reasons not to be turned on right now. Everything... Yes, that you see, hear, smell, touch, taste, everything that you think, believe, or imagine, and also all of the internal body sensations that your brain codes as a potential threat. And it sends the turn off signal. So the process of becoming aroused is the dual process of turning on the ons, yes, but also, and often more importantly, turning off the offs. That's a long list. Yeah. It's a long list. So you're already thinking of things, and I'm totally sure that your things are going to be on other people's lists, too. What did you instantly think of? Kids, Uh bills, responsibilities, work, you know, did the handyman come in today? Uh All all the fun stuff. Yeah. All the adulting that, you know, we don't get an insight into when we aspire to be adults. I love that you put it that way. That it's the adulting that gets in the way. Because, like, what's the yeah. most adult behavior humans engage in? It's sex. But also, sex is a form of play. Right. And it's hard to release ourselves into the experience of play, even if it's very grown-up play, when we still have mm. this massive to-do list. Let's talk a little bit about uh, getting out of, you know, your own head. Because I feel like that's something that... Um, oh gosh, yes. Me, me personally, I mean, very, very difficult, and I'm sure a lot of people, you know, deal with that. Yep. Um, it's like, it's like this expectations that I have of what I'm supposed to feel and experience, mm-hmm. standing in a way of actually what I'm currently experiencing. Um, how do you navigate that? Yeah. So I know you mentioned, you know, putting down the list and understanding that you have the accelerator and the brakes, but do you have any kind of piece of advice or anything that you can share? So there's mm-hmm. a, a spectacular activist and organizer named Adrienne Marie Brown, who has a background in sex education. She wrote a book called Pleasure Activism, and I had the opportunity to interview her for my own podcast. Um, Mm -hmm. And she literally changed my life in that conversation. She, we were talking about my own struggles as a person who works from home. Like I spend all these hours in front of my computer, in my head, reading, writing, and then I leave and I go out into the world and I find it really difficult to get out of here and back into my Mm -hmm. body and into my relationship. And what she suggested for me was a gratitude for pleasure practice. So it's like a standard gratitude practice, but instead of it just being gratitude for anything at all, it's what's a specific experience of pleasure that you had today that you are thankful for? And it sounds really simple, Mm -hmm. but like at the end of each day, talk with someone, talk with your partner about a pleasure you experienced that you're grateful for. And the more you do it, I found, and I've been doing it for months now, The more you do it, the more you're looking for the moments of pleasure over the course of your day to choose as one that you are grateful for that you had. And it makes you more sensitive and aware of the pleasure that you're already experiencing, which in turn makes it easy for you actually to experience more pleasure. This really simple practice has made it so much easier for me to shift out that like stuck in my head place into my body Mm -hmm. and my relationship. I absolutely love that. It's a simple thing to do. It is. Definitely takes practice, but I love that it's something that, you know, doesn't require you to stop everything you're doing in order to fit it into your life. 
Yeah, mostly what it looks like is like have a five minute conversation with someone you already wanted to be talking to. This was an amazing conversation. I have to say, I had all these questions so like focused on sensuality and like the specific of it, but I love how from the beginning you just, you know, broke through this small little part of what I wanted to talk about and make it into, you still touch on all the points, but make it into a much bigger conversation. And I really, really appreciate it. You're very good at this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Emily, please uh, tell us where can listeners find you and learn more about your work? I have a podcast called Come As You Are from Pushkin Industries and Madison Wells available wherever you get your podcast. Uh, of course, there are the books Come As You Are and Burnout if stress is more your thing. Emily, I really appreciate your time and all the gems that you shared with us throughout this conversation. It has been my pleasure. No, but really. Looking for meals that are ready to eat, delivered to your door, and help you feel your best? Sakara is the answer. Sakara delivers science-backed, plant-rich nutrition programs and wellness essentials right to your door. Their ready-to-eat meals are nutritionally designed to deliver results, from ease bloat to boosted energy and clear skin. And right now, Sakara is offering our listeners 20% off their first order when they go to sakara.com slash Valeria or enter code Valeria at checkout. That's Sakara, S-A-K-A-R-A dot com slash Valeria to get 20% off your first order. Sakara.com slash Valeria. Valeria.